Okay, thank you everyone for being on time and we will resume this session. Thank you. So it is with great pleasure that we start this afternoon session by welcoming Rich Robert, Richard Roberts. Please, Rich, come in. So Rich is currently at New England Bow Labs in Beverly, in Cambridge, sorry, Massachusetts. I think it was before Beverly. It's oh, okay. And I'm not putting on here all of what Rich did because there's a lot of his work which is not in the field of bioinformatics. I mean, you could say is basically the pope of restriction enzyme, of uh, intron, but here I put only a few buzzwords on some of the achievements which have to do with the field of bioinformatics. Starting with rebase, with after PDB is probably the longest uh, database which has been around. I mean, uh, PDB started in uh, 72, 73, and rebase started in 74. So it's not maybe well known that rebase is one of the oldest database still alive in the field of uh, bioinformatics. All of his paper on evolutionary studies, nomenclature of enzyme, restriction enzyme, cleavage site prediction, frame shift detection, and so on. Special issues of NR, all of those which were there in the 80s are grateful for Rich in his, uh, I would say, with his art of editor of NAR, of having pushing those things which became after the NAR special issues, but at the time as they were those supplemental volume which were really a mine for all of us wanting to write paper, writing software to know what was happening and what people were doing as well. And open access, of course. As geographically linked, I put the first three cities where, I mean, of the first part of a rich life when he was in England, Derby where he was born, Bath where he studied at primary school, Sheffield University, and then he moved to the U.S. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Cold Spring Harbor, where it was a long, long time there. And I put Beverly for, Mass for New England Bar Labs, but uh, as I can understand now, it's both Beverly and Cambridge. So you, the list of bar links will be enormous. I've only put, I mean, the number of people with whom he has worked, starting with Jim Watson when he was in Cold Spring Harbor, Phil Sharp with the famous papers that all of you know, Alpha Don Com, Tom Gingeras, so I didn't put it in uppercase, Sanjay Kumar, Janos Pospai, Rocco Wilson, Dana Masselis all of those names that people here would recognize. I was speaking about those issues of NR even before the first issue, which I think was in 1980. There were already papers for publishing in NR, and this paper was very important for all the people wanting to write software for sequence analysis. That was one of the earliest papers, I would say, in the field of sequence analysis. And here you see Rich with uh, Dr. Ashcroft and Charles Clement in uh, IG Nobel Prize ceremony in 2000, but of course, Rich not only participated to IG Nobel Prize, he is, of course, a co-recipient of the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1993. And so there's a lot of people, once they get a Nobel Prize, that gets, I would say, a big ad. And we're lucky in these communities that it was never the case for Rich. I was amazed when he received a Nobel Prize. I was at the US area, and I saw that just before they catching the plane. Arrived in Geneva, sent him an email. I mean, it was uh, 11.58 a.m. Saying, congratulations, you probably won't read this for a long time. And two hours later, he thanked me for having sent a message, which for somebody which was emailed, was probably swamped and phone numbers, uh, phoned by a lot of things. And I mean, this is only typical of Rich. Whenever you ask him a question, whenever you want something, send he's there. And thank you, Rich, for all you have done in, for the field, everyone in this field. And, uh, of all those years. Thank you. Well, one of the things, yes, you absolutely. Well, just put it somewhere so I can see it. Yeah, one of the things you learn as a journal editor, it's really quite important to um, answer emails and keep on top of your email. Now, I want to start just with a couple of things here. The first thing is that. As many as, you, many as you probably know, I'm a big fan of open access. And one of the things that I've really tried to do is to go out and proselytize in favor of open access. I fortunately don't need to talk to this community about it. You all know that if you had complete and open access to 
the literature, the biomedical literature, if it was all in one place where you could sort it, where you could data mine it, it would make a huge difference to what most of us do. And I think this is something it has to come, and it's only a question of how long it's going to take. And I think it's in all of your hands to actually support this effort, support open access journals, review for them, send your papers to them. Uh, but there's a lot that individual scientists can do. Very often individuals feel alienated from the system. They can't do much. But here is a case where individuals really can do a lot. Next thing I want to do is to thank all of those people who've been authors and reviewers for nucleic acids research, especially for the reviewers. I know there are many of you in this room who I feel I know quite well but have never met in person. Um, I'm immensely grateful for all the work you do as reviewers. This is absolutely crucial to any journal. And so please do come and say hi if you're one of those people who I think I know well but have never met. I've already run into a, a few such people here, but I know there are many more. Amos already mentioned Rebase, and it really is a great pleasure to be here and support Swiss Prot and all of the wonderful things that have been done as a result of the databases that Amos has um, been involved in. One thing he didn't mention was ProSite. Um, Amos actually beat us to the punch on ProSite. We were thinking of putting something together um, that looked a lot like ProSite. I, in fact, had a grant application into NIH, and then ProSite came along and sort of beat us to the punch. So um, I never got involved in doing that sort of thing, although we have had a lot of interactions with um, motifs of one sort and another, but mainly within the context of Rebase. Rebase started in 1974. At the time, it was basically just a typed piece of paper that eventually got circulated all over the world. And as technology changed, it changed, the platform changed, and it's now a fully integrated relational database and freely available to anybody who wants it. It's supported by the National Library of Medicine, and so that makes life um, rather easy. One of the things about Rebase is that um, there is now an extensive section on genomes, and any of you who are interested in annotating genomes, um, I do encourage you to get in contact with us and to think about having us take a first look at genomes for restrict potential restriction systems. There's an awful lot of misannotation in GenBank and the other major databases concerning restriction enzymes, and I hope during the course of this talk to give you um, some pointers and indicators about restriction enzymes that will be useful. And the web address for Rebase is just at the bottom there, but a Google search will bring up Rebase as the top hit. So I'm feeling lucky works well. Now, I realize there are probably some of you in this room who are not that familiar with restriction enzymes. These enzymes are fascinating from many points of view. But in particular, I think they offer a microcosm in many ways, of the kinds of genes that are present in bacteria. These things are only found in bacteria and in archaea. Um, with one exception, there's an, actually a virus, a plant virus, um, that carries restriction systems, and we don't know. It's not plant, it's a chlorella-like organism. Uh, but this virus, we think, may have two hosts, one being a eukaryote and one being a prokaryote. But anyway, members of this virus class have lots of restriction systems. But other than that, they're restricted to bacteria and archaea, and they're very interesting. They serve as kind of a primitive immune system, uh, but they may have other uses that we don't know about. I, I always used to tell the story that, you know, when people were originally discovering recombinant DNA, um, they were given a restriction enzyme, they were given a ligase, uh, and you could actually make new combinations of things in this way. Well, bacteria have restriction enzymes, and they have ligases, and maybe they too could be using them in ways we don't understand. This cartoon is really intended just to show you uh, more or less what's going on. How do I get the arrow? Oh, here's the arrow. Okay, so this, um, this chap here, the gremlin, uh -uh. that's the downside. The gremlin shown there is a, a restriction enzyme. What it does is recognize DNA that is coming into a cell and then cuts it up and stops in this way phage infection or transfection or other ways that DNA might be getting into cells. And they have the interesting property, they recognize specific sequences. And so um, this turns out to be incredibly useful for molecular biology 
Um, why the bacteria chose to do it this way, we still don't know. Now, of course, because, um, because all bacteria have their own DNA, um, these systems would be lethal to that bacterium unless there was a protective mechanism. And what happens is that the organism carries a methyltransferase, a DNA methyltransferase, that methylates specifically the sequence that is recognized by the restriction enzyme. And in this way, stops the adverse effects of the restriction enzyme. And so what happens in real life is that when a new piece of DNA, of unmodified DNA, comes into the cell, then it's a competition between the restriction enzyme and the methyltransferase to see who gets there first. But nature typically has stacked the deck, so the methyltransferases turn out to be very poor enzymes catalytically. They're slow, they, they just do not function terribly well, whereas the restriction enzymes are incredibly powerful, and so they're very good catalysts, unbelievably high specific activities most of the time, which is good when you're doing digests in the lab in a test tube, and these things digest everything very quickly. Uh, but that also prejudices this competition in favor of the restriction enzyme. Now we know of four major types of restriction systems. And this is where often some of the genome annotators start to run into problems. The type 1 enzymes are three subunit enzymes. And typically, you see all three subunits together in the genome. They're arranged either next to one another or separated by just one or two, occasionally three open reading frames. The R subunit is the part of the protein that is responsible for restriction. The M subunit does the methylation, and the S subunit specifies the sequence that is going to be recognized. And these multi-subunit enzymes have a total of five subunits, two R products, two M products, and one specificity product. And depending upon the state of the DNA, if it's already hemimethylated, as occurs after replication, then methylation kicks in and it doubly methylates. If it's unmethylated, then restriction kicks in. Occasionally, unmethylated sequences can serve as a substrate for the methyltransferase, but this is pretty rare. The problem with these enzymes, as far as the molecular biologist is concerned, is that although they recognize specific sequences, they cut randomly. They cut all over the place. And so you don't get nice specific fragments. And for that reason, it's the type 2 enzymes that are far more interesting, and the ones that are prolific, and the ones that are in everybody's freezers, and in the catalogs. And it's the way, of course, that New England Biolabs got started, and we started making our money from selling these things. These enzymes recognize a specific sequence, and cut that sequence either directly at the sequence or very close to it, but always in a specific fashion. So the recognition sequence can be completely specified. Because of the interest in these enzymes commercially, there was a tremendous amount of effort has gone in around the world looking for new enzymes. This began back in the early 1970s when I moved to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. When I moved there, there were six of these enzymes known in 1972. And within a couple of years, we had about 60 or 70 of the enzymes. And it was at that point that Rebase actually got started, because just in order to keep track of what we knew and what enzymes were there and where they'd come from, um, I put together this little database, and I've kept it up ever since. The systems are composed of two genes, and these genes operate independently of one another. They're not coordinately regulated, and they're not in an operon but they are usually right next to one another. So they're either adjacent on the genome or they're separated by one open reading frame. The R gene specifies the restriction enzyme, the M gene special, specifies the methylase, and they operate completely independently. The type three, oh, and there are 3,700 of these for which we have functional in, in, um, experiment, experimental evidence. That is, someone has actually gone and done an experiment to show that the protein exists and what it does. So it's one of the largest classes of proteins, enzymes out there, for which we actually have experimental evidence that they exist. The type 3 enzymes are rather interesting. They're related in some way to the type 2, but they have properties 
intermediate between the type 1 and the type 2 enzymes. They again recognize a specific sequence. They always cut a long way away from that sequence. And they have other properties. And until recently, it was very difficult to actually get these enzymes to give complete digests. And so for that reason, people weren't terribly interested in them. A group recently figured out how to make them give complete digests. And so they too may become commercially valuable at some point in the future. The type 4 enzymes were actually the very first enzymes of this class ever discovered. And what these enzymes do is to recognize modified DNA. So these will cut DNA that is already modified. And undoubtedly, they arose because many bacteriophages uh, were busy modifying their own DNA to, pr to get away from the action of the restriction enzymes. And so the cell responded by now developing systems that would only cut modified DNA. Some bacteriophages have gone even further. It turns out restriction enzymes that recognize GGCC are very common in, in bacillus, in soil bacteria. And a number of bacillus phages have just taken all the GGC sequences out of the genome in order to protect against the action of the restriction enzymes. Now, for the rest of the talk, I will mainly focus on the type 2 enzymes, although I'll be mentioning a little bit about some of the others. These enzymes come in a variety of flavors. Um, as you will see, in addition to the prototype system that I illustrated on the last slide, in which you just have a simple restriction enzyme and methylase gene, there are also examples where there's an additional gene involved. This is a C gene, a controlling gene. And this controls the expression of the restriction enzyme when the systems move from one cell to another. One of the problems that we encounter in trying to clone these systems is that if you take a restriction enzyme and just put it into a naive E. coli strain and it expresses the restriction enzyme, then it's going to kill E. coli because there is no protection. And so imagine if one of these systems were out in the wild and found itself heading into a new bacterium that was previously unmethylated, then it would do the same thing. And so what this C gene does is actually to turn off the expression of the restriction enzyme gene until the whole system has become established, the host genome has become fully methylated, and then it's safe to express the restriction enzyme. And we know of a number of systems like this. There are probably something like 50 or 60 systems we know of that have picked up this auxiliary gene to help out. And so that can be a very useful characteristic when you're trying to um, identify these systems in the genome. Now you'll notice this third system here, HPH1, the recognition sequence is asymmetric. Whereas in the case of the first two, the recognition sequence is symmetric, and so one methyl transferase can do both strands, because both strands are the same. In the case of HPH1, the two strands are different, and so you need two methyl transferases, one for one strand, one for the other strand. If you didn't have that, what would have happened after semi-conservative replication is you would soon end up with an unmethylated strands. So this, again, is very nice when you're looking in genomes and trying to annotate these systems. You can be pretty certain when you have two methyl transferases, the enzyme is recognizing an asymmetric sequence. Sometimes you find cases where you have two restriction subunits, and these typically occur when one restriction subunit will cleave one strand and the other will cleave the other strand. And this can be very useful in a technological sense because you can then make mutants in one or other subunit and end up with an enzyme that will specifically nick one strand or the other. And we know a number of these that occur naturally, but many more that have been made artificially. I just want briefly to mention AHD1 because this turns out to be um, perhaps an early example of something that could be much more common. AHD1 has the organization of a typical type 1 system. It's got a specificity subunit, it's got a methyl transferase subunit, and a restriction subunit. But it behaves just as though it were a type 1 enzyme. If you pull out the system, characterize it biochemically, it looks just like a typical type 2 system. It recognizes a symmetric sequence. We know of at least two, maybe three more systems that look exactly the same organization 
They look like type 2 systems if you do the biochemistry, but by gene, by genomics, by just sequencing it, they look like type 1 systems. We think these are type 1 systems that have evolved by losing a part of the specificity subunit and hence becoming type 2 systems. And we think we may be able to do exactly the same thing um, artificially in the lab, and we have a research program aimed at doing that at the moment. Um, if we were able to do that, that would be useful for a large number of reasons. One is it gives access to a lot of new specificities. None of the type 1 enzymes recognize sequences that look like the type 2 enzymes. And it would also offer us an easy way to determine the recognition sequence, uh, because at the moment that's quite difficult for the type 1 enzymes. We have another example, BCG1, uh, of something that has a specificity subunit. But here, the restriction enzyme gene and the modification gene are fused into a single entity. And then finally, at the bottom, there's a case where a system has an extra gene, a V gene. This gene is actually a nicking endonucleases, uh, nuclease that recognizes CCGG, uh, but on one strand, but CT. GG on the other strand, um, which would be the result of 5-methyl C deamination. You can go from 5-methyl C to T. This happens spontaneously and rather easily. It's the reason that the CG dinucleotide is so low in mammals. And here, this system recognizes that it causes a problem, that it's mutagenic when an organism has it, and so it comes along with a little repair mechanism. And so this endonuclease cleaves every time there's been a deamination event and then allows access for the host repair machine. Now, when I first started Rebase, and in fact until 1992 or 93, everything that went into it was experimentally determined. Um, so there was no predicted this, predicted that. Everything was on the basis of biochemical experimentation. Since 1992, when there started to be a fair amount of flanking sequence for genes going into GenBank, and then, of course, in 95, when the Haemophilus influenza sequence came along, and then yet further sequences for genomes came after that, this has been an incredible source of new information, and most of this has gone into Rebase. At least everything that I've found has gone into Rebase. And so what I'm doing here is to show you what's happened as a result of genome sequencing. So Everything that is shown solid here shows material information that has gone in on the basis of experimentation. That is, the information is solid. We know that it's correct. All of the stuff that's shaded is rather more shady information that has come from sequence predictions. And you can easily see that what's happening here is that among the type 1 systems, there's just way more potential um, systems here stuff that looks as though it should be type 1 systems, then there is anything for which we have experimental evidence. In the case of the type 2, because we have so much experimental evidence, and that still overwhelms the picture. But there's another reason for this too, and that is that restriction enzymes fall into this class of genes that are evolving incredibly rapidly. And so typically, when we look at a new sequence, and we're looking for a restriction enzyme gene, you can't find them. They don't show up very often in similarity searches because typically, even when you have two enzymes that recognize exactly the same sequence and cut at exactly the same point, they have no recognizable sequence homology. And this has led into something rather interesting that we've heard a little bit about in this conference, but something which I think is both important and really interesting. And that is, you know, as Antoine Danchard mentioned, every time we get a new genome sequence, there are loads of genes that look as though they're unique to that genome. Just don't occur anywhere else. The question is, the question I have, is how many of these look like these restriction enzyme genes, which fall right into this category? That is, they do have orthologs, and they do have homologs in other genomes. We just can't recognize them by sequence similarity. And so this raises the possibility that among these genes, which we thought of as either orphans or sequence-specific, strain-specific, how many of these really are just orthologs of one another that we cannot find by sequence similarity? And are there ways that we could find them? 
In the case of restriction enzymes, we do have some indirect methods of getting at them, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. But there are many other genes that it would be really nice to know whether they truly are orthologs of one another or whether they're really specific for an individual genome. The lesson here is clear. If you look at the type 2 systems, the methyltransferase genes, you can see that the ones for which we have biochemical evidence, the solid blue ones, um, are very small by comparison with those for which we have no experimental evidence. And this is because we can really do a good job of predicting methyltransferases. They have well-conserved motifs in them, and so we can find them very nicely. Now, if we look among the various type 2 restriction enzymes, of the ones that we have, of the 3,700 we know about, there are 262 different specific sequences that are recognized. And in this context, I'm talking about a specific sequence as being AGCT, CCTC, um, AG, pyrimidine purine, CT, or whatever. And that is that they can be specified, their recognition properties can be specified by one specific sequence representation. Of these 262, we have 188 sequenced examples, and pretty soon we're going to have a lot more. We've just embarked on a program. We have 50 enzymes we sell at Biolabs, and we don't have cloned and sequenced yet, and we've just sent the first batch of 25 of these off to 454 to have the genome sequenced, because in almost all of these cases, we have N-terminal sequence data, and this turns out to be by far the most cost-effective way to get the genes. Cloning these things can be a real pain because the systems don't like to clone any coli. So we hope that we'll have another 50 of these within, oh, probably the next six months or so. But we have quite a lot. And I thought this was very important because I thought that once we had one representative example of each sequence specificity, if we now looked in a genome, found a methyltransferase, found an open reading frame nearby that should be a, a restriction enzyme, it would either match one of these, in which case we would know the specificity, or it would be completely different, in which case it would be new, and so this would allow us to discover new ones. Well, that turned out not to be quite as helpful as I wanted, and I'll show you why in a moment. Um, the methyltransferases, their specificity usually matches that of the restriction enzyme, although if you think about it, there is no evolutionary pressure on the methyltransferase genes to have exactly the same specificity as the restriction enzymes, provided their specificity covers whatever is recognized by the restriction enzyme. If they methylate a few other sequences, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just important that they methylate the sequences recognized by the restriction enzyme in order to provide protection. And let me just mention some of the bioinformatic problems and so on here. The M genes are easy to find. Methyltransferases have very nice motifs in them. Um, the S genes, the specificity genes of the type 1 enzymes, these are really easy to find. They have well-conserved regions um, that are shared among all of them. And the V genes, these nicking end endonuclease genes, are easy. The C genes, the controlling genes, fall into two categories. There are some that are very easy to find because they all look like one another. And there's another set that again seem to be evolving quite rapidly and they're quite different and really one needs experimentation. You, you can see sometimes these genes, they sit between an open reading frame you know is a restriction enzyme, another one is a methyltransferase. It's a fair bet it's going to be a C gene, but you have to do the experiment to know. And finally, the restriction enzyme genes are almost impossible to find unless homologs exist. When homologs do exist, then typically the restriction enzyme recognizes exactly the same sequence and has exactly the same sequence specificity, that is, it cuts at the same point within the sequence. But that's not always true. We've recently come across a few examples where you have genes that seem to be pretty similar to one another, but the way in which they cut DNA is a little bit different. And so this is something you have to be careful about when annotating genomes. Um, it's not good enough just to say, well, because it looks like this, it's going to exactly match it. That means I've got five minutes, is that? Okay. Here's one of the problems. We know of enzymes that recognize GATC. For instance, there are four families of enzymes that recognize GGCC. There are five families. This is just by doing sequence comparison. Um, 
it may be that these things all have the same structure. Um, we have examples, actually, of two enzymes that recognize rather similar sequences and almost match one another structurally. But a problem here is we just don't have enough structures. Uh, but I could easily imagine that, say, among the GATC family, we have four groups by sequence, uh, but we only have one group if we were to look at structure. And so we're actually embarking on a project with Anil Agarwal to get the structure for four representative examples here to see if that is in fact true. But we have a lot of these things. There are a lot more structural opportunities. Uh, let me skip through these. This is just showing how the motifs can help. What I really want to do is just to tell you about something cute to finish off with. So some time ago, I was actually taking a shower and had one of those shower moments when I suddenly had what I thought was a good idea. And I thought, well, we know when we try to clone restriction enzyme genes, um, you can't typically clone them, because if you clone them and they express, they kill the host. And so I thought, what will happen if you look at the shotgun sequence data sets that are coming out of the genome centers? Any, G any, any clone that should have contained an intact restriction enzyme gene will be missing from the data set. It shouldn't be there, because if the gene was active, then it will have killed the host. And so it should be possible to look at all the shotgun sequence data sets and look for gaps upstream or downstream of potential restriction enzyme genes. So we went back. I talked to the people at Tiger. They dug out all of the data for Haemophilus influenza. Um, this was Hindi 2. This is the very first restriction enzyme ever found for which um, Ham Smith got the Nobel Prize, shared it with Arbor and with Dan Nathans. The red gene here is the restriction enzyme gene, and this is a big gap upstream of it. You remember when you do these shotgun clones, you get about 2 to 3 kb of sequence going into one of these clones. So you're just looking for clones that would be 2 or 3 kb long. So just as predicted, there was a nice gap. We look on the other strand. Um, Again, there's a nice gap, if I can get the pointer there. Be gone. Well, it's lost. You can see the red gene at the bottom. There is one clone in the middle. It turns out that clone is a chimera. It doesn't contain the whole sequence. But other than that, there's a nice gap there. The same was true for other systems that we looked at. This is a putative system. Um, we had actually looked to see if we could show activity for this one and couldn't. And sure enough, the shotgun data shows the same thing. We then went and looked in sort of things for which we had data. A lot of, when we were doing this, a lot of the people were not depositing the data. It's a bit difficult to get all this shotgun, all the trace data, but many more people are depositing it now. Um, I've been encouraging people to do so. If you look here, you'll see in Methylococcus capsulatus, and there was one nice gene. It's shown in red at the top. It was the putative restriction enzyme gene. We know it now is a restriction enzyme gene. Um, didn't look like anything else in the database, but it had this nice gap in the sequence up and down, as you'll see in the display at the bottom. Uh, when we checked it out, it turned out it had exactly the same sequence as BSSH2, a known enzyme, recognized GC, GC, GC. Um, if we looked at MCAT1, this new enzyme recognizes the same sequence, but cuts at a different position within the sequence, which means it will be useful. And the lanes 1, 2, and 3 show what happened when you make just a little bit of this gene product by in vitro transcription translation and from clones that contain either BSSH2 or MCAT1. Uh, the double digest is in the middle showing there's absolutely no difference. And so that confirms that the sequence was what it is. We've looked at a number of these things now. And this turns out to be a very nice discovery tool. But it's also a very nice use of shotgun sequence data. So it means you know these people actually did an experiment when they were generating the data for the shotgun sequence. And if you look through that data, you discover there are a lot of other genes that don't like to clone into E. coli 2. A lot of these turn out to be membrane proteins. Uh, we've not done a detailed analysis of everything that's there. But there are a lot of genes that fall into this category. And so the shotgun sequence data is actually very useful from an annotation point of view. And here's some people who did an experiment on a whole bunch of genes. Many times they have no idea what those genes were. And so there's data to be mined and information to be mined out of that. So we, we were rather pleased about that. I just want to acknowledge Janosz Poshfai, who is a computer scientist who's worked with me for many years now. 
Tamash Vinche is a programmer and does sequence analysis in conjunction with Janos. Yu Zheng is a new postdoc. He was a graduate student that I helped supervise down at Boston University. Rick Morgan is an experimentalist at New England Biolabs. And Dana Marcellus is the programmer who's been with me for many, many years running Rebase. And I think without these people, Rebase uh, and this whole field uh, would be much the poorer. So I thank you all for your attention, and, and good luck to Swiss Prod. We just have time for a single short question. Okay, no question. Good. Good. Thank you very much again.